Okay, well, I'm, go I'm going to talk about a few things. Um, I'm going to talk about some things that I've kind of been working on for about 35 years now that are finally coming to fruition in these months. And I'm also, just because I live off these kinds of things, I, I, uh, get, I'm going to get to show you some stuff that uh, just went live about 15 minutes ago that um, uh, we'll see whether it works. Um, so the thing I, I mostly want to talk about is the Wolfram language. It's something that I've been uh, progressively building for about 35 years. Uh, it's a programming language, new kind of programming language in many ways. Um, it's uh, sort of emerged from what I've done with Mathematica and with Wolfram Alpha, um, to some extent with things I've done with new kind of science. And uh, it's also come about because of a bunch of new things that we figured out in the last few years. So Mathematica, as, as many of you may know, is a computation system that uh, we released actually 26 years ago now that's uh, very widely used in R&D groups around the world and in universities and, and those kinds of places. Uh, Wolfram Alpha, sort of another one of the components that's uh, allowed us to build towards the Wolfram language, we released about five years ago now. Um, it's uh, what we like to call a computational knowledge engine. Its goal is to take uh, random questions people ask it. Um, oh, come on, let's, yes, okay, there we go. Let's ask it a random question. Um, let's see if I can make this, there we go. Um, and uh, uh, try to, to answer them. And it answers, answers some of those questions on the web. It answers some of those questions um, uh, through intelligent assistance like Siri and so on. Um, and its, its goal is to, as I say, take natural language in, use, if we can connect to the web. If we can't connect to the web, this is not going to be much fun. Um, OK, there we go, at least. Um, so, so the idea of Wolfram Alpha is it's ingested a large amount of knowledge that we have curated and tried to make computable. And the goal is, if there's a question that can, in principle, be answered on the basis of knowledge that's sort of been accumulated in the world and that we've been able to curate and make computable, have it be automatic to have that question be answered by the system. So if we say something like, um, you know, what is the population of St. Louis? Um, we should, if we can connect to the web, we should be able to get some answer. The goal is to kind of give a report that tells us something about, um, uh, sort of contextualizes the answer here. So we've got some data. Um, okay, this is so we can say, what's the population of St. Louis divided by Chicago? That's something that we as humans can understand. So can the, the, our natural language understanding stack um, and, and give us a result. We could ask it all kinds of things. You know, there's all kinds of data that comes in. Typically what happens is um, that there's sort of raw data, and then on top of that data, one builds up sort of a collection of models and methods and algorithms and so on that allow one actually to compute answers to the specific questions people want to, want to know. So there's a feed that, for example, tells uh, the system where all the various satellites that are in orbit around the Earth are. And from that feed, we can compute the current position of something like the ISS, and we can work out that from St. Louis, um, it's currently not visible. It will next rise at 2.57 AM, and so on. Um, or we could go ahead and type in uh, all kinds of things here. You know, We could type some random sequence like this. And uh, we might be able to guess as humans that that's a genome sequence. That's probably what it will figure out that it is, too. It will go and um, uh, try and look that up on the human genome. OK, the expected number of matches on the human genome is 0. But in fact, oh, there's 1. That's cool. Um, the, uh, it's um, uh, so. So all this knowledge that we've been accumulating um, in Wolfram Alpha, and there's a, there's a lot of it about um, thousands of different domains, um, uh, this is all knowledge that we've been sort of ingesting, putting on our servers, curating, making computable, and so on. All this knowledge is now one of the components that goes into the Wolfram language. OK, so let me show you the Wolfram language. I'll show it to you here. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I'll show it to you here uh, on. Um, on the desktop, there's also a version that's purely in the cloud that just runs in a web browser that I could also show you. Um, but let me show you the, the, um, the desktop version. Let's see, is that large enough or is that way too small? Small? It's too small. OK, how about that? Yes? Yes, OK, good. All right, let's see if it's working. OK, that's a good sign. OK, so let's say you know, we, can, we can do all kinds of computations here. Um, so there's a result. Um, let's say, I don't know, we've got a whole bunch of digits there. Know, let's, let's just for fun, let's make it, give, give it a few more digits. Let's say something like this. Okay, great. We've got a few digits here. 
um, let's say we want to do some analysis. Let's treat that as data. So let's just say, what are the integer digits in that number? Um, let's, uh, let's treat that as a big lump of data. There's 38,000 digits there. Let's, for example, say, let's make a histogram of uh, what the, um, uh, which, which digit is most common. OK, there's the result. Uh, maybe we could go ahead and um, let's make a histogram. Let's, let's do this. Let's say um, we take uh, the digits. OK, so what do we have? We had integer digits of, um, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4 to the power, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 0 plus n, for example. Let's say we make, um, let's say we want to just make a histogram of that, and we want to make a little interactive application that works out these histograms. So let's say we say manipulate that with n going from, let's say, 0 to, uh, I don't know, 50 in steps of 1. Now what we should have here is um, some kind of little interactive histogram that just shows us the, um, uh, the, the, the different results for different, uh, different powers there. Maybe, maybe, maybe it would be easier if we just take, um, take this and just make um, a table here of values for n goes, for, let's say, from 0 to 5 or something. And now we'll get just a little, bunch of little graphics there. And may maybe we want, um, let's say, we want this to be uh, something that's suitable for putting on the web or something. Let's say we, we could say, you know, use a plot theme that is... Uh, uh, appropriate for the web. Okay, I just made it slightly brighter and made the, made the axes simpler. Okay. So the, the general idea of the Wolfram language is to sort of put as much knowledge and as much automation about that knowledge as possible right into the language. Uh, many, most languages say, let's keep the core of the language very small, um, and then let's let all kinds of random people build up libraries that do specific things based on that language. Uh, my idea in the Wolfram language is Let's put as much as possible into the language. Let's make the language as big as possible. Now, that puts a, a huge burden on the language designer, which ultimately has been me for the last uh, many uh, three decades or so, um, because th that means that it's up to the language designer to keep all of these different pieces of functionality consistent and to have frameworks that gradually grow to accommodate sort of a growing amount of functionality. And by now, there are about 5,000 built-in uh, functions in the, in the Wolfram language covering all kinds of different things. So uh, let's, uh, we, can, we can just, just to get some sense of what's there, this is kind of the, um, uh, the, the sort of the, the big outline of the kinds of things that are there. But let, let me show you some, some more specifics of kinds of things you can do. So let's say, I don't know, we could pull in, uh, let's say we pull in data from, uh, from my Facebook uh, uh, friend graph. Um, and actually, I will not tempt fate by doing the real thing. Let me, let me simulate my Facebook. Uh, <laughs> Uh, friend graph. Okay, there's a, there's a pretty good simulation. That's a, that's a graph with 100 nodes, 200 edges, random graph. Let's, let's, um, let's take that graph. Okay, we pick up the graph, and let's say let's make a uh, community graph plot um, of, um, uh, of that graph showing the communities that exist within that, within that graph. So, so there we have it. Um, we could go ahead, we can, we can deal with all kinds of things in the Wolfram language. So, so let's say, for example, let's pick up a current image. See, oh, very dark, let's try it again. There we go. Okay, lousy image, but um, uh, let's take that image and let's say, for example, let's take that image, we say edge detect, let's take the image in there. Okay, there's an edge detect of that image. And maybe I can go ahead and say, you know, something like dynamically uh, edge detect um, the current image, and then I should get something which interactively goes and lets me wave around and uh, um, detect image. We can take, actually, let, let's, take, let's take this one. Okay, people like that, all right. So let, let's take this guy and uh, 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 let's start trying to do a little bit of coding here. Let's, let's break this image into little blocks. Um, now we can do something like, uh, what can we do with these blocks? Let's, let's do, uh, let's say, let's say, um, oops, let's image rotate by, um, uh, uh, how about we do this? Let's do image reflect onto those blocks, level two there. Okay, now we can take that. So I've taken each little block in there and I've um, uh, flipped it, I've reflected it, so let's assemble that again. Okay, that's a little weird. Um, the, <laughs> We could do that in real time if we want to. I mean, we could go ahead and just say, um, let's, just, let's just pick that whole thing up and let's just put in um, uh, current image there and let's say um, uh, image assemble here and then let's, oops, image assemble there and let's say um, 
Uh, we want to make that dynamic. Um, I think this will work, we'll see. Um, and, oh, what did I just do wrong? Oh, what did I do wrong? I did not tell it. What did I not do? Right. Well, it's very beautifully, dynamically, I'm having that picture go there. Um, uh, what did I do wrong? Uh, ah, partition it. Yes, very good. I, that was hopeless. That's, um, without that. See, this is the problem. This is the disease of somebody like me, that I make these things up. Um, OK. Yeah, it works well. <laughs> so, let's try. <laughs> this is good. That's, uh, I should. Uh, um, all right, we better, we better kill that off. <laughs> it's looking too goofy there. Um, oops, what did I do? I should. Um, I just. Uh, ah. Let's just kill that one off. It's going to distract me now, to no end. OK. So let's, let's try something else. How about we try, let's just try making um, a bunch of random integers, let's say integers minus, minus 1 to 1. Uh, let's make 100 random integers. And let's do, let's, let's make this into kind of a random walk. So let's take those random integers. Let's accumulate so that we're just making cumulative sums of those integers. OK, there we get the result. Let's take that and let's like, make, um, make those into uh, notes, sound notes. Let's try taking this. And then let's say make a sound out of that. See what happens if I do this. OK. OK. Wasn't that exciting, but we can, maybe we can try, um, uh, let's say, um, let's try doing that. Let's make, let's make the time a little bit longer. Oh, OK. So, so, okay, so we can deal with all kinds of things, whether it's networks or images or sounds or, you know, we can do image processing, we can do signal processing, all those kinds of things. Um, one of the things that's sort of a really important feature of the Wolfram language is that it also deals with sort of things about the real world. So, for example, if I say here, here is a geoposition. If I say sunset, it knows about sunset at this geoposition. So, for example, I could say something like, you know, sunset tomorrow, uh, minus sunset today, um, and that's probably going to be, oh, it's very, very close to one day, right? Um, and uh, of course, it knows about units and things, so it can figure out um, uh, what that is in terms of, uh, if I say minus, um, let's, let's do this, minus uh, one day here, then it will go ahead and tell us, um, uh, tell us that. We can also, um, uh, so one thing we're doing here is using natural language as a way to um, uh, to input sort of a specification of things in the world. Um, so, for example, let's say I say planets. Okay, that's an, that's an entity that represents planets. So I could say, uh, let's give me an entity list. Okay, so this will now be a list of entities that correspond to planets. And though, so, for example, I could say something like entity value uh, associated with those of image. And now I should get um, images of the various planets. Okay, there we go. Um, and now, for example, let's say I could take, um, let's say I could go back to this list of planets here, and I could say something like, um, let's, let's, let's put these all together. Um, so let's take these, let's list the planets, okay, so we've got entity, uh, entity value of that, comma, image. Um, well, actually, let, let's do another entity value. Let's say that, comma, mass. Okay, so there are the masses of the planets. Now let's go ahead and get, um, get our list of images of the planets. Um, and now let's try and take, okay, we've got those two together. And now let's take um, uh, the last two, uh, percent means the last line, double percent means the line before that. It's actually very, very bad practice to use percent and, and, and so on because it uh, doesn't make for, for beautifully, um, uh, there are better things you can do if you're actually writing code, but I'm being fast here, so I'm going to do that. Um, so let's go um, uh, percent, percent minus percent. So what I'm now going to do, okay, there we go. So this made an image collage um, out of the pictures of the planets with the size of each planet be corresponding to uh, uh, being determined by the mass that we had computed for those, for those planets. So that's kind of nice. So we can, I mean, we know about all kinds of different things. So for example, let's say, let's see what, whether we can get this up. Okay, let's, um, <laughs> so we're now going to um, load in a bunch of data about movies. Um, from our uh, knowledge base, 
and let's try taking a, um, I just tried actually something like this. Uh, I was showing people um, uh, this. Let's try something like this. Let's try taking uh, 50 random movies, and then let's, uh, OK, there we go. OK, wake up. Hopefully, this will work. Um, OK, so let's try and get 50 random movies, and then let's, OK, here's 50 random movies. Each movie is represented as kind of an entity. And let me say, um, I'll say entity value of that comma image. And let me, some, some of them, let me just say delete missing. Um, and that will get rid of uh, ones where there isn't an image associated with that movie. Um, this should get us uh, the, um, the posters for those movies. OK, so there's 50, well, some number of random movie posters. And now we could say something like, for example, we could say um, uh, dominant colors associated with those movie posters. So this is now doing some image analysis um, of each of those movie posters to try and figure out dominant colors. OK, there we go. And now maybe what we can do, let's, let's make something like a chromaticity plot of those, um, of those colors. And we can see kind of the clustering of, um, uh, of movie poster colors on the, on the chromaticity diagram. Uh, if we went to a little bit more effort, we'd probably go and look at the release dates of those movies, or, or maybe more interestingly, the box office returns for those movies, which we also have, um, and compare them with the, with the colors that uh, were used in the posters and see whether it's, it's good to have a green poster or something. Um, and we can, uh, uh, OK. So we know about all kinds of things. Let, let's, try, um, uh, let's try something else. Let's say um, uh, we want to um, uh, do something with uh, uh, geography. So this will give us, um, based on where it thinks we are from our GOIP location, um, this will give us um, uh, graphics. How about we do, I think there's a nice, um, let's do something like you know, the Eiffel Tower, OK? So that's an entity for us. And this will be graphics, um, uh, a, a map showing the region around the Eiffel Tower, hopefully. Um, and uh, come on, wake up, there we go. OK, so there's a picture of Paris. Um, so now what we could do, maybe we can make a disk around the Eiffel Tower, and let's make that disk be a, a radius, which is, um, let's try doing this. Let's say it's, a, it's radius of, um, uh, let's make one of those like powers of 10 type things. Um, so we'll say it's a, a 10 to the n mile radius disk. And let's say, um, uh, yes, there we go. OK. And now let's make a table of those things with the, uh, with the n and 10 to the n going from, um, uh, from 1 to, let's say, from yeah, 0 to 4, let's say. OK, so then what, what hopefully it will do is to make a series of, um, of geographic pictures. Uh, we told it to put a disk around the Eiffel Tower um, with a radius of 10 to, the, 10 to the n miles. Come on, wake up here. Um, and, uh, and then display that. Um, display a, a, th that on a map. OK, so there we go. So there's, uh, that's close in, a little bit further out, further out, further out. There we go. And now, OK, that's kind of weird. So, so at, uh, at 10 to the 4, that's, that's almost the whole Earth. There's only a little tiny piece of Earth that's not, um, uh, that's not reached by that disk. OK, so, so then we can, I mean, in, in the system, we know about all kinds of things. So for example, let's say um, uh, we, can, we can sort of combine all these different pieces Let's say we look at the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and let's say one of the things we might know about the Atlantic Ocean is uh, where are there shipwrecks in the Atlantic Ocean? Okay, um, So there'll be some list of shipwrecks in the Atlantic Ocean. It's kind of remarkable to me that you know, it, d just directly in the language, you can pick up all this kind of data. We could say something like geolist plot of those entities. Um, and hopefully, it will. Load in, come on, wake up, OK. If the network is connected, OK. There we go. OK, so that's the positions of uh, shipwrecks in the Atlantic Ocean based on data that, we, uh, that, that came from, from the language. All right, we can do all kinds of things. Let's say, let's do something different. Let's do something with words. So OK, so there's a list of 100,000 words in English. Um, let's go ahead and say something like, um, let's, let's just look at the lengths of those words. Um, so let's get those lengths. Let's go ahead and make a histogram of those lengths. Um, so this will tell us the distribution of lengths of words in English. OK, that's nice. Uh, maybe we can go ahead and do something different. Let's say, um, how about we find the first letter of um, uh, each word in that dictionary? OK. And then let's go ahead and say, um, let's make something which says, let's make a tally 
of all those first letters. Actually, I'll tell you what. After we've gotten the first letters, let's, let's make them all uppercase, just so that we make everything consistent. Um, and then let's tally up all those things. So that's telling us the number of A's, the number of A whatever's, um, <laughs> A rings or whatever. Um, and, and now we can say something like, um, let's, let's, just, uh, let's just say something like this. Let's say, um, uh, let's try something like, um, let's try this, see what happens here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, take that and apply it to this list. OK. So what this is doing, let's actually let's do it in a different way here. Let's do divided by 100, for example, here. Um, and OK, so what that's doing now is it's making uh, each letter in the size that um, corresponds to the number of times that letter occurs as a first letter in, in English in this case. OK, just for fun, we can try and do it. I don't know. Let's try and do it for, um, uh, let's say, Russian, for example. Um, OK, then we should get, let's see what happens here. Maybe it, hopefully it can load in a Russian dictionary. Wake up. No. Terrible. Well, all right. It's odd. All right. OK, let's put it out of its misery. I don't know why that didn't work. Let, let's, um, I'm, I'm surprised that didn't work. I think maybe it's time for me to look at the documentation and know whether I actually did, the, did, it, did, did this right. I think I did. Um, OK, let's see. Oops. No, for some reason, it's refusing to do that. Who knows? Um, OK, so, so anyway, there, there, there are lots of kinds of things that we can do with, uh, with data. Um, one of the things that we, we can also sort of, uh, one of the things that we curate is data formats as well as APIs and uh, as well as actual ordinary data. We're also interested in curating data formats and curating APIs for communicating with data. But let's, let's just say we go and um, uh, let's pick up some data from, uh, from the world, so to speak. Let's say we, um, uh, we get data from uh, a UN website, for example. Oh, that's not what we want. Let's try um, something like that. OK, there we go. So that's some, that's some plain text scraped from uh, the front of the UN website. And now maybe we can go and say, let's um, uh, split that into uh, uh, on every new line. Um, and now let's say, now one of the things that we have, and remember, one of the goals of the Wolfram language is to automate as much as possible. So one of the things we've done is to put in all of this uh, state-of-the-art machine learning stuff, but try and make it as automatic as possible. So you don't really have to know about um, the, the, the details of the machine learning. You can just, in this particular case, you were using a built-in classifier for human languages, and that's telling us what language each of these different phrases was in. And looks looks reasonably good there. Let's, let's try, let's see if we can actually, let's, let's try doing something a little bit ambitious. Let's see if we can build a classifier for something, okay? So let's, let's try and build a classifier of paintings, okay? So, um, okay, there's Vincent van Gogh. He's an entity in our system. So um, uh, let's see what properties he has. Um, so one of the properties he probably has is, um, along, with, along with things, he probably has a property, a notable artworks property. OK, that seems relevant. So let's take Vincent van Gogh and let's say notable artworks there. Um, and uh, let's, um, that, this should give us a list of notable uh, Vincent van Gogh artworks. There we go. Let's try doing the same thing. OK, so let's, let's call this VG for van Gogh. Um, and uh, OK. And now I'm going to, let's say, these are bad variable names, but anyway, never mind. Um, the, uh, let's, uh, let's have Picasso, and let's, um, let's take uh, some of his notable artworks, um, and let's go ahead like that. OK, so now let's get, um, uh, let's say, let's take, um, I don't know, let's take, uh, I don't know, 20 um, uh, notable artworks from um, uh, Picasso, and um, let's, get, uh, um, let's get images from those. Um, so we go ahead and ask for this. Oops. Um, OK, so let's get those. And then what we're going to do, so the, the goal of what we're doing, OK, so there's, there's 20 random artworks from Picasso. OK, so let's go ahead and take the corresponding thing from Mr. Uh, Van Gogh. Um, and let's do the same thing there. 
and let's call the AVG for that, and let's um, say, this is terrible, I shouldn't be doing this. I, sh I should be doing this, this in a much more organized way. But, but anyway, okay, so let's take this. So we've got our list of, of um, uh, Van Gogh uh, things. So let's say those are, um, uh, so let's say the Van Gogh ones are, um, uh, let's say all of those are, let's just put in, let's put in Van Gogh as, a, as, a, as an entity here, okay? Um, and now we're going to take, um, so now we're going to uh, do this. We're going to thread those. So we just get a list of um, uh, painting and Van Gogh. And then we're going to take the same thing where we say that for wherever it was, uh, Picasso, that was line 20. Uh, bad programming practices, but still. Um, uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, Okay, so now let's let's put in that for Picasso, okay, um, and now let's let's then flatten that out. Okay, so what we should have is a bunch of this is this is sort of our training data set, right? Um, bunch of paintings by Van Gogh, bunch of paintings by Picasso. Okay, so now let's say classify those, and what we should get out from that is a, a classifier function. It's using random forests in this case because it decided that was the best method. This is a function that we can now take and apply to a random picture. So for example, let's take, let's take another, somewhere here, we, let's take some one we didn't, hadn't got, so let's take whatever that one is. Um, okay, so let's take that, that image there, that picture, let's see what that picture is. Um, okay, so we're just gonna take out the image for this, and, oh, oh dear, oh well, okay. Sorry about that, well, let's try, let's try another one. Um, it can happen. Uh, okay, try another one of these. Otherwise, we'll just try a random one. But let's try. Uh, come on, let's get the image here. Network, come on. Oh, there we go. Okay, we got an image. Great. Okay, so now what we want to do is take the classifier function that was there and apply it to this particular thing. And we didn't have a large training set, so I have no idea whether it's actually gonna work, but let's give it a try. And it said Picasso, which is presumably wrong. Is it wrong or is it right? I don't know, where was that one? What was, what was I looking at there? <laughs> you know what, it was right. It was right. <laughs> okay. So, so, okay, so that, that's just some sort of indication of, of the kinds of things that are in the, in the Wolfram language. And as I was, was mentioning, there's sort of a very, uh, a very broad collection of, of kinds of knowledge and algorithms and so on that, that are, are part of the language. Um, big system, sort of the, the goal that I've had is to sort of think about all the kinds of computations that people might want to do, all the kinds of knowledge that people want to work with, and to try to sort of organize all of that sort of computational work into these kind of repeated lumps, which we can then sort of give names to in the language and then implement as efficiently as possible. And it's sort of been interesting in terms of the implementation of algorithms, the more we build in the language and the more we set things up so that every different piece can interoperate, the more we're able to build really powerful new kinds of algorithms. Because it's a typical thing, you know, you're doing some algorithm, you think it's about, um, I don't know, geometry, for example, but it turns out that algorithm actually needs to make use of you know, algebraic computation inside the system and it needs to make use of some kind of optimization thing and so on. And because all those different pieces are all part of the language, it becomes sort of easy to build your new algorithm on top of these giant building blocks that have been created before. Well, we can do, um, uh, there's, um, one, of the, one of the questions is sort of how does all of this work? What, what's, what's the underlying idea? So this is a symbolic language. So you type in X, it just says it's X. Just like you can type in Van Gogh and it just says it's Van Gogh. Um, and uh, you, know, you can obviously do symbolic things. You, know, you could say you know, factor X to the thousand minus one or something, and we can treat that as a, as a mathematical symbolic variable. Um, but we can also, but any kind of construct in the language um, is represented in this kind of very uniform way as a symbolic expression, which is effectively a tree kind of structure. And there are various kinds of operations you can do, like a very common thing you might do is to say, you know, nest list, and you could, that would uh, give us a successively nested versions of this. 
And for example, let's say the function here that we used was you know, framed or something, then we get successively nested uh, versions of that. Or we could go ahead and we could say you know, nest list of you know, edge detect of our you know, current image uh, 10 times or something. And uh, oh, come on, let's do it again. And we'll, there we go. OK. And that will, you know, all of these kinds of things uh, can be done. Uh, you know, so, so nest list is just sort of a generic function that works on any kind of pure function. Notice that this notion of pure functions um, is used a lot in the system. So for example, when I built that classifier, what came back was a pure function. If I wanted to say, uh, for example, let's take those, um, uh, I don't know, we could take those images if we wanted to from, that we just got, and we could make a function that gives us, that is a function which when applied to an image will tell us um, what image it is nearest to, okay? Um, so, you know, I apply it to that image, it will tell us, okay, it wasn't very exciting because it will tell us the nearest image is that image itself. But the whole point is this is a, this is a, a pure function that came back that can then be applied to arbitrary data. And that's a pretty common mechanism in the system. And one sort of builds up this sort of whole tree of these kinds of things. So, so one feature of the system is sort of everything is symbolic. You know, when you type in some expression like this, you know, that's symbolic. You can say, what's the full form of that expression? Okay, there it is. Or you could say, you know, the thing is a tree, right? So it's, it's, um, so we could say, you know, what's its tree form? It looks like this. Everything we deal with is a symbolic expression. So, you know, for example, if we make a 3D graphic, you know, that's just a symbolic expression which happens to uh, uh, render as a 3D graphic that moves around. Or, for example, this whole document that we're working in, this is also a symbolic expression. You know, I could add uh, a section heading to this document and so on. Um, all of this is also a symbolic expression. So, for example, we can do things like, let, let's imagine that we make a, we can make a, a template document. So we could say something like, um, uh, we could uh, say, um, uh, you know, the heading, and then we could say, put in an expression here, which is a date string, which is the current date. And then let's say, um, uh, more info, and then let's uh, put in something which is um, an expression that corresponds to uh, the current location. And now we could say, so this then becomes a, a template for a report um, if I wanted to, I uh, just with these, um, this simple input, I could say generate that report, and now I will get back this, this thing here. What's happening underneath is that all these things are just symbolic expressions, and it's just applying the same symbolic expression processing mechanism to all of them. So whether this was a string or a document or a piece of XML or whatever, it can apply the same kinds of symbolic uh, operations to it. Well, another big, big feature of the language is, is that, um, as I say, everything is a symbolic expression. That means there's a lot of uniformity in the way that things are represented. The uh, question is, what do you do with symbolic expressions? Well, the big thing you do with symbolic expressions is you find that you, you can uh, make transformations on those symbolic expressions. So for example, uh, one, one of the things is the, this notion of patterns. So when I define a function, I say f of x blank colon equals, I don't know, x times f of x minus 1 or something. That's saying that. Uh, well, let's, let's, no, actually, you know what? Let, let's forget that. Let's, let's say, um, let's just say f of 1 is equal to 1, okay? So now I say, what's f of 1? Okay, it says it's 1. If I say, what's f of 2? It says it's f of 2. I don't know what f of 2 is yet. But now if I say f of x blank, the blank stands for any expression. So this is saying uh, f of any expression is x times f of x minus 1. And now if I say, what's, you know, f of 20 or something, it'll duly tell us it's a factorial. Um, and what's, what turns out to be very convenient is uh, you can, uh, all of these patterns work all over the place. So for example, I could, I could define a function f, um, which when it sees g of x blank and x blank here, then it will transform it into, you know, h of, uh, uh, you know, x or something like this. And now whenever I type in f of g of 6, comma, 6, and then let me put something else in here, I can say, you know, f of g of... Um, 7, 8, um, then what will happen is it will transform the first one but not the second one. Um, this, is a, this is a very general mechanism. This is how the whole system works. It's just these transformation rules for symbolic expressions. And uh, this, is, this is the way the system has worked uh, for 26 years. And, and um, uh, it's, it's sort of a very, uh, a very powerful way of doing things and very general way of doing things. And, and sort of everything gets represented in terms of symbolic expressions in this way. Well, so another thing that we sort of realized recently is that we can also represent not only the operation of the language, but also the deployment of the language in terms of symbolic expressions. So let me show you how that works. 
So let's imagine we're going to deploy something to the web. Let's say we're going to create a form, and uh, this seems to be my favorite one these days. Uh, cats, I believe, are uh, popular on the internet. So we'll make a, a, um, a form that, uh, um, that does something with, um, let's, let's do this. Let's make a form that will make an image of a cat breed, OK? So let's, let's make it nice and big. Um, OK, so what this is, this is a form function. Has a, it's a field with a name breed. And that, that field is going to be a cat breed. And now what we can say is deploy this to the cloud. So take that form function and uh, deploy it to the cloud. Now we'll get back this uh, cloud object represented by UUID. We go on the web, and it tells me to sign in. Okay. Um, the, um, and I could, have, I could have said make that a public uh, form, but OK. So now I go, and this is now a form that was created. Uh, we're using our natural language understanding stack. So this, this field is kind of a smart field that understands natural language and is expecting a cat breed there. And now if we go and uh, uh, compute that and run it, we'll get a picture of a cat breed. Now let's, let's go and change this a little bit. Let's say we want to also add something which uh, gives us, you know, rotates the cat by some angle. OK? So... Um, uh, Let's say that, that's probably going to be a number. And then let, let's just put in something here that says rotate um, that by angle. Uh, oops, no, we don't want to rotate by the name of the breed. Let's do that. Um, the, um, OK, so now we'll get, we should get a field with two forms, a, a, fo a form with two fields. So let's say uh, you know, we've got a Siamese cat here, and this is a smart field that says it's expecting different kinds of, you know, any kind, any kind of cat. And let's say, oops, I, that, that angle was in radians. So let me, um, let's, uh, let's put in like two radians. I forgot to tell it it was in degrees. Um, so, okay, so now we have a rotated cat. Okay, so you say, so what's actually going on here? What's going on is I just deployed this symbolic form to the web then it's running, it's just a form on the web. When you uh, 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 submit the form, it goes and runs the Wolfram language code in our cloud and returns the result to the web. Now, I can also take this thing, and instead of making it a form, I could create an API from it. So I can just say, make that an API function. And now cloud deploy. And the API function on its own is just a symbolic object. But I can say, cloud deploy the API function. Now, if I go to that. Uh, OK, if I go to that API, it's a RESTful API, and I didn't give it any parameters, so it will just give me an error. But if I were to figure out how I can move in this field, oh, there we go, um, I could go here, and I could start filling in, if I can get my web. OK, so I can say, you know, breed equals Siamese, uh, you know, um, uh, angle equals uh, four or something. And now, now it will use that as a RESTful API and call that same piece of code and give back the result. Okay? And you can, you can obviously get the output as JSON or XML or whatever else you want. I happen to tell it in this case, just give me the output as a PNG, just because it's easier to see what's going on. Now, you can also take the symbolic API function, and um, uh, you know, there's just a pure symbolic API function. We can take that, and we can say, give me embed code for that for, let's say, an external Java program. Okay? So now what this will do is it will generate code which allows one to call <laughs> that... Um, uh, so, so in, in the case of Java, there isn't a, a cat breed data type. But if there had been a cat breed data type, it would have tried to match up data types so that it gives you a nice piece of code uh, to, call, uh, to call the API with the appropriate conversion of data from the native language that you're using, and so on. OK. So, so this is a whole um, uh, sort of a whole stack of technology here. You can get access to all the knowledge that's in the Wolfram language and all the computation and visualization and analytics and so on uh, from APIs that you create um, that go inside um, uh, that, that can be put inside other languages. You can also immediately uh, create mobile apps. In fact, these uh, these forms um, can be immediately used in in uh, uh, mobile apps. Well, there's one on iOS that's about to come out. You'll actually be able to directly create APK files for Android that simply implement um, a little app based on the Wolfram language code that you have. And, and the stack has, has many different pieces. Um, the, this, this particular piece of code will call our public uh, Wolfram cloud. 
Um, you can also get a private cloud so that you have that working within your infrastructure. Then you can call that instead. Um, you can also not call a cloud, but you can actually have a version of the Wolfram engine that's running on a local network. You can even have a, a, a library version, a DLL, that's the Wolfram engine in a library that you can actually link into the program that, um, that you're calling it from. And all of that happens in, in, a, in a transparent kind of way um, using this kind of embed code mechanism calling the Wolfram language. And sort of our, our goal is to have um, the language uh, just run on in all possible environments and be deployable as universally as possible. And we're sort of steadily moving towards that. You can also do things like um, uh, we, we support lots of kinds of parallelism and so on. Um, so for example, I don't know, let's say, um, uh, let's do something really boring here. Let's, let's say uh, make a table of uh, 30 process IDs, and this is just going to run locally on my machine here, which has, I don't know, four cores or something. You'll probably see for a moment it will start up the, the kernels on different cores, and then it'll give us a result. Okay, so it started four kernels, um, and it distributed that not very exciting computation of finding the process ID um, across, those, uh, across those different things. If we ask it the counts there, it'll have shown us, okay, so two of the cores got eight, uh, eight uh, 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 instances running, and two of them got seven. Um, there's a much more general mechanism for doing this across networks, and uh, uh, we're building a whole bunch of things for discovering processes out there. Uh, one of the interesting things we've realized is that we can represent these running processes also as symbolic expressions. Well, another thing that we've been doing is trying to connect all of this to all sorts of devices. Um, one of the things that we have um, is uh, we sort of inventoried lots of kinds of um, uh, devices that exist in the world. This is a sort of another uh, curation effort like so many others, and we've been sort of steadily working through, okay, so here's about uh, 3,700 different kinds of devices that measure all kinds of things, and you can, you can get all the data for these devices in, in, um, in Wolfram Alpha and so on. Um, but uh, what we've been doing is sort of steadily figuring out how to connect all these devices into the Wolfram language. One of the things that will be coming out with soon um, is a thing that we call our data drop, uh, and that's a mechanism, let's see if I can show you. Um, that's a mechanism for, um, uh, oh, there we go, no, not, that's not gonna work very well. Okay, it's a mechanism for accumulating data into the language from sort of anything, a web API, email, tweets, whatever else, um, or directly connected device, um, and being able to conveniently from within the language pull up a data drop and treat it as just another, another piece of data that can be operated on. And, and obviously, we have ways of operating on time series and things like that, so it all becomes rather convenient. Um, I should say that one of, the, one of the nice ways of doing this, the Wolfram language is, is bundled with the Raspberry Pi computer, for example. So a, a good way to actually connect to physical hardware is to just plug the hardware into the GPIO ports of a Raspberry Pi, then use this data drop mechanism um, to, to send data into, through our cloud into sort of any instance of the Wolfram language and to sort of the whole stack of things, including uh, Wolfram Alpha and so on, that, uh, that rely on the language. Okay, so one question is, okay, if you're, if you're going to use all this stuff, how can you actually develop things with it? Um, well, one of the th what we've been doing, this language in the, in the form that I'm showing you is, is very new, and we're just starting to release actual sort of products um, that make use of the language. Um, so, for example, one of, the, um, one of the things that we brought out uh, a couple of months ago now, in beta form at least, is what we call the programming cloud. Um, and the idea of the programming cloud is that, uh, let's see, hopefully I'm logged in. Um, the programming cloud, you can use it um, directly in, in a web browser. So here I'm just going to get um, the exact same environment that I had. Wow, that's small. Okay, let me see. How do I... Um, there's got to be a way to make this bigger. There has got to be a way. This is supposed to be a beautifully responsive design. Um, <laughs> the um, humph. Well, okay, well here, I'll tell you what, I know a way to, maybe I can cheat. No, that's weird. Well, who knows? Okay, let's see if we can do anything here. Wow, let's just see if we, the, okay, we can do something here. All right, let, let's, um, uh, it's kind of a, it's kind of difficult to get, um, to replicate the whole sort of user interface experience that we've built over the last 20 something years um, in the, um, uh, uh, in, in the native environments um, within a web browser, but we've, uh, we've, we've got a quite a long way in doing that. 
But what's important about the programming cloud is you can develop your code. You can develop it either in this, in this web environment or you can develop it on the desktop. And then you get to deploy it into our cloud and create all those instant APIs and instant forms and so on, or scheduled tasks or whatever else. So that's one thing that we're building based on the Wolfram language. Another thing that we're building um, is a data science platform where kind of the idea is that there's a flow from data sources, and we have many different kinds of data sources that we can, we can bring in through sort of the analytics layer of the Wolfram language and then out to reports that you generate. And it's pretty neat being able to, to set all that up so quickly and have something where you can either you know, schedule a report to send a PDF every, um, uh, you know, every Monday morning, or you can set it up as an instant API, which is then called from some uh, device or some uh, mobile app or whatever else. Um, so that's, that's another thing that's coming. So another thing we found interesting about our language is that I think the, um, uh, that we sort of realized, uh, I've been thinking about it for a long time, but people really pointed this out when we started showing videos about what the language could do. This is a great language for people to learn programming in because you can immediately start to do things that sort of relate to the real world and you can, you can get a lot done uh, with very simple pieces of code. And in fact, it's, it's sort of interesting to see how should people learn this language. I think it's very much more like learning a human language than it is like learning perhaps more traditional programming languages. I think sort of immersion language learning seems to be the right approach, where you basically just say, OK, just look at some code that works and try and understand, um, what, uh, and try and understand things based on just looking at code that works um, and then um, uh, and then try and go from there. And st after you've looked at enough code that works, then go and read that 15-page introduction to the language that tells you the principles and tells you about pure functions and tells you about uh, uh, you know, pattern matching and things like this after you've seen a bunch of code that works. And so we're building a thing we call Programming Lab, um, which is a thing intended for kids um, that uh, uh, is well, not just kids, actually. It's really intended for anybody who's, who wants to learn to program. Um, and the idea is that um, uh, we just show some code here, and then we say, OK, you can, you can do this yourself. And if this wasn't so big, let me see if I can make this the right size. Um, uh, OK. Um, so you know, it just says, go ahead and I don't even know what this is supposed to be, but I should have actually read the text. Go ahead and add the, I don't know what I'm doing here, add the stripes to the mandrill. Um, and OK, we get a striped mandrill. Um, the, uh, but the point is that this is, um, uh, the idea is um, that this is sort of a, 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 you know, you have some objective, and you're trying to produce these, these quite short programs that do something interesting. And this seems like a very attractive way for people to start learning to program. OK, well, so one of the features of this is that um, one of the features of this language is because it has so much built in, it means that a piece of code that does something quite non-trivial can be really short. And so this is a neat feature. And I thought, how can we show off this neat feature? And so I had this idea recently. Uh, what, what about if we, you know, we have programs that are really short that do interesting things. What, what's a place where really short things show up? Well, Twitter. So why don't we think about having tweetable programs? And so why don't we think about having a thing that's, uh, uh, that allows you to tweet in a program and then has the system respond to it? Well, as of about an hour ago, a little less than an hour ago, there should be a thing up on the web. Let's see if this is really true. There is a thing that is called, uh, let's see, um, Wolfram tweet a program. Let's see if it's really there. Come on. Ah, there we go. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the, that's um, OK. So, so what this is is something where you send in a tweet, and uh, it will, OK, these are, these are random things people have been, um, uh, have been tweeting in. So let's look at that one. Um, OK, so this is, OK, so these are, these are random programs, little programs that people have been tweeting in that generate output. So let's uh, actually, we can take a look just for fun. I'll, I'll show you a few examples that I've made of, of what one might call tweetable programs. Um, and it's kind of remarkable that, that, um, uh, that you can make anything non-trivial in sort of the, um, the space of a tweet. Um, but let's see, what, um, uh, let's see what we can do. For example, well, one, um, uh, let's see, here's one. So we can, we can take, uh, the, so this is, um, this is a sort of a simple, the obvious simple hello world example um, <laughs> interpreted from modern times. The, um, and, uh, you know, we can do um, 
all sorts of things. Like, you know, it's, it's almost, uh, I think it's like code poetry in some sense. You know, here's a, a very simple piece of code. Uh, that's what it does. And if you look at the piece of code, you kind of uh, think about it a little bit. You'll have sort of a, an aha moment as you realize, OK, there's a table of things, and it's making tuples out of those, and it's making points, and it's showing that in 3D and so on. It's sort of an interesting form of communication that kind of almost is shared between humans and computers, because humans can read this code, and computers can read this code and, and do something with it. And of course, you can have, uh, now I was trying to figure out what's the shortest program that does something interesting. So here's, a, here's kind of a ridiculous little hack um, that makes uh, a Sapinski in, uh, oh, how many characters is this? This is a very modest number of characters here. Let's see, um, uh, 36 characters, not too bad. Um, and you can do things like, um, let's say, uh, uh, I don't know, let's, um, let's look at, uh, you know, we can, we, can, we can do all kinds of things. I don't know, here's a, um, let's see what this is. So I think just fits in a tweet um, that will make a random collection of polyhedra in 3D space, which I think isn't bad for something. Oh, great. That's... You know what? That's what happens if the power cord is disconnected. The... Oh, the might have, things might have run a bit faster. I don't know whether that's some. Um... Um... Anyway, so, so uh, all kinds of things like this. I've been, I've been trying to figure out what's the, what's the sort of shortest program that does something interesting. Actually, I have to say, I spent some decent part of my life studying very small programs because I've been interested in sort of understanding to what extent one can uh, make a science of sort of the computational universe of possible simple programs. And uh, way back when, I, I uh, well, I, I started studying these systems called cellular automata, which are uh, simple programs, which are just lines of black and white cells. And I had this experiment that I did 30 years ago now, more than 30 years ago now, uh, which was sort of the thing that led to this whole new kind of science that I made. And it's kind of fun that as of today, that, that experiment is now tweetable. Um, so that's the complete code um, that does that experiment and shows us and generates all these pictures that show the result of running different simple programs. So for instance, that's, um, what did that just do? The, um, that's really weird. Uh, that would be, what on earth did that do? That is the strangest thing. Um, I think this is what I get for running at incredibly low resolution here. All right. Anyway, so, so, uh, so actually one of my, one, one of the things that's interesting is these are tiny little programs and um, the question is, what do these programs do? And, and sometimes these programs just do really trivial kinds of things, um, but sometimes they do really quite complicated things. So there's an example of, a, of my all-time favorite uh, very simple program that does something complicated. It's called Rule 30. It's a cellular automaton. It just has a little rule that you can write in, in uh, a tiny fraction of a line. Um, it starts off from just one black cell at the top there, and uh, it makes that very complicated pattern. What's interesting about this is it's a program that's sort of just out there in this computational universe. And when we try and do programming, one of the things, what we usually do is when we do programming is we try and engineer things. We try and figure out how am I going to incrementally build a program that does what I want. An alternative is just go out in the computational universe and go try and mine programs that do something interesting. So this particular one, Rule 30, is a useful one to mine because it's really good at making random numbers. Um, if you just look at the center column here, it's uh, actually been for the last 25 years, I think the, the single, the only sort of surviving uh, random sequence generator that hasn't been cracked in some way or another. Um, and uh, it's a, actually, we, we, recent, we used it for a long time in our technology. We actually recently retired it because we did a huge search in the computational universe and we found uh, a, a cellular automaton that's a bit more efficient at generating randomness than this. But it's sort of an interesting approach because what we've got here is a, uh, is a program that uh, is just found in the computational universe. It's not engineered by humans. It's found, and then we choose to entrain it and use it for our technology. Um, and this is an approach to programming that I think will be increasingly of interest. Um, it's something that we've used for many years now of just going out into the computational universe and searching trillions of possible programs to find ones that do things that are useful for us, whether it's for image processing or hashing or function evaluation or, or whatever else. Um, and then just use those in our, in, our, in our programs. Well, one of the questions, if you're interested in science, um, one of the things that I spent a lot of time studying is to what extent these simple programs can represent models of uh, the natural world and so on, um, and to what extent you can uh, use, you know, people have traditionally used equations and things to model the natural world, been interested in to what extent you can use programs to do that. Sort of the, the ultimate question then is, well, what about the whole universe? 
Um, is it possible that we can model the whole universe in terms of some simple program that uh, can be specified and, and then we'll just run and reproduce space and time and all the other things that exist in, in, in the universe? And so the real question as of today is, uh, if we find, if, if the universe corresponds to a simple program, is that program short enough that it's actually a tweetable program? And so <laughs> the question then becomes, you know, is the universe ultimately tweetable? Um, so uh, that's my question for the day. I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm hoping uh, one of these years to be able to, to, to do the physics, so to speak, to figure that out. But um, uh, one thing that um, uh, sort of coming, coming back to... Um, uh, to, to practicality, um, you know, we, we've tried to build the Wolfram language to sort of automate as much as possible, to build in as much as we can. Um, how long the code for the universe will be in the Wolfram language, we don't yet know. Um, but uh, uh, the code for lots of things um, is, uh, is remarkably short and easy to write. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting is I think with this sort of new kind of programming language, um, one's able to go from sort of ideas, algorithmic ideas, to actual uh, uh, running code and actual deployed products in sort of the shortest path that we've ever seen. And so I'm sort of looking forward to seeing what people will do um, with this sort of uh, uh, new, new ability to program, sort of new direction in programming. Um, and now we, we, we're starting to have these tools and products and so on that let people actually take this, this, the idea of this language um, and use it to actually build products and, and, and such like. So, um, I think that's probably everything I had to say. I hope we have time for questions and things. I've probably gone way over time, I don't know. But, but um, uh, um, I hope, uh, yeah, thanks. Two minutes. Who, who, I'm sorry. Uh, that's what I get for not having a clock. Excuse me. Yes, please. Hey, um, I love Mathematica. I use it every day. Do you expand a bit on the interop situation for the Wolfram language? Like what? how easy it's going to be to consume from other languages? Uh, well, I mean, consuming it from other languages, I think the, the primary mechanism is creating instant APIs and using embed code to be able to call those instant APIs. That's, a, that's, the, most, uh, that's the most sort of... Uh, uh, that's the easiest to deploy mechanism. We have this thing we call WSTP. It's a remake of a thing we used to call MathLink, which is a more sophisticated two-way communication protocol um, that uh, allows you to really get exchange symbolic expressions and so on between programs. Um, I mean, that's, a, that's something that's been built out for C and Java and a bunch of other languages and allows very close sort of interoperability between the Wolfram language and external programs. But I think for most applications, building these instant APIs is, is the way to go in terms of connecting it to, to other languages. Please. I can't see somebody. Yes, back there. Yeah, so, okay, so the question was about contributions into the language. You know, we, we've had, for Mathematica, we've had a very successful website called the Demonstrations Project, and it has about 10,000, um, uh, uh, there are about 10,000 um, interactive demonstrations that people have created here. Um, and what's interesting about these, they're kind of open code things, and because the code is very short and readable, people regularly take code from here and, and use it for other purposes. Um, in terms of the ability to sort of have a, a marketplace mechanism for little lumps of Wolfram language code, um, that's something that we intend to build. It isn't built yet. Um, it should be rather straightforward. I mean, what we've tried to do is to make sort of a consistent language that has, in, in our case, you know, 5,000 built-in functions and um, uh, some number of tens of millions of sort of built-in entities and things like that. Um, and we've tried to make the effort to sort of make all of that consistent, and it's been a lot of work. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, on top of that, people can build all sorts of interesting things. And, and people in, in the Mathematica uh, sort of uh, uh, precursor of this, people have been building all kinds of things for, for a quarter of a century um, that are based on that system. I think it will be a, a more effective ecosystem for the Wolfram language, and we have some nice modern, modern mechanisms, I think, for dealing with it. Maybe one more. If we can... Yes, please.
Yeah, I've tried to write, you know, I, I write a blog occasionally, and I've tried to write a few things about design. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated story. It's really, you know, this is what I've been doing for 35 years, language design, and I, you know, there's a lot to say about it. Um, I mean, I think that the, uh, and it's interesting to me that my, my view of language design has evolved somewhat over the years. Um, and uh, so, you know, for instance, um, uh, you know, one thing that's really critical is things like the naming of functions, right? And it takes forever to name these, these things because if you get, if the name is uh, too specific, people don't understand the generality of its use. If it's too general, people don't know what it is. Um, and what, one of the things, an example of something that's evolved in the last decade for me, okay? When I was first building uh, languages, I, I thought that if there was something which could be done as a simple idiom in the language, just let people do it with that simple idiom. If it can be done in you know, two functions or something, just leave them with that idiom. I realize that's wrong. If that idiom has a, has a well-defined name, you might as well have a function that corresponds to that idiom, because then when people see the code, they know, and they see that thing in the code, they know, okay, now I understand what that is. If it doesn't have a reasonable name, you shouldn't try and make up a name for it, um, because it, it won't help anybody. One of the things that actually we're, we're working on now, because our language is symbolic and you know, code and data are the same thing, it's easy for us to process programs like data, and so we can do all kinds of interesting sort of symbolic refactoring of programs and so on, and we can do things like program simplification, and we can do all kinds of things to do with people trying to make sure that people to help people write good code. One of my theories about programming languages is if you have a, a, a well-designed programming language and you're, you, know, you have some operation you're trying to do, the, the, um, and the sort of various variants of that operation that you might do, the one that corresponds to the shortest piece of code is the one that's likely to be correct. And if what you find you know, as a result of simplifying the code is you've got, you know, mostly it's a simple piece of code, but then there's these weird if conditions off the end, those weird if conditions are probably bugs if it's a well-designed programming, langu well programming language. So that's a type of thing that we're thinking about. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't really know how to communicate. You know, within our company, for example, um, it's been, you know, when you design 5,000 functions, um, you know, you, I didn't do all of that myself, so to speak. Um, and, you know, it took me a long time to train people to understand sort of uh, design methodology for, for um, uh, for understanding how things work. I, I'll say one other thing about design. Um, for me, one of the things that's most interesting about design is that it is, a, it is the best way to force you to really, really understand an area is to try and design functionality around that area. And I realize every time I, I try and sort of, uh, you know, uh, cut corners and not really, really, really understand at the very fundamental level what's going on in some particular area, that's the time when I'm likely to make a design mistake. Um, and because what you end up having to do is, you know, you start off with all this complicated functionality and you say, and there's a hundred different things you might want to do and it's going to turn into 200 different functions and they're all very complicated and you don't know any framework between them and so on. And then, uh, you, you know, you, you have to kind of dig, dig, dig and try and understand, you know, what is the sort of unifying principle. And sometimes it's taken me decade, two decades sometimes, to understand what the sort of unifying principles are. Example. We just uh, introduced a large geometry subsystem in the language. We've been thinking about that for 15 or 20 years, how to specify geometric regions in a way that was, was completely general and so on. It took a long time to see how to do that. Um, another thing I might mention is, is um, two more things about design. Just, just um, uh, I could go on about design for ages, and I'll shut up in a moment, but, but um, uh, the, the um, uh, two more things. The, the, one thing is that this kind of symbolic paradigm that I originally started working on in, in the first language I designed, which was a thing called SMP, which was a precursor of Mathematica. Um, SMP was a, a language I designed it starting in 1979, and uh, it, was, it was really useful to design a language, which, you know, the language turned into a product, it turned into a company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it was a language which in many ways was much more bizarre and extreme than languages, than, than what I've designed in what's now the Wolfram language. Um, and I made many stupid mistakes in that language. For example, that was a time when people couldn't type very well, so having short command names was important, which is, of course, completely irrelevant and silly in, in today's world. Um, and that language was, um, uh, you know, I tried to be much more kind of fascist about saying it's a, it's a language based on transformation rules for patterns and so on. And, and I said, that's the only thing you're going to be able to do. If you want to do procedural programming, forget it. Right? That was a mistake. 
I mean, what, what, you know, you ha when you design a language, whatever your, your, sort of your theory of things has to be, the language is ultimately for humans, and humans have a certain set of experiences, and they have a certain sort of knowledge base, and you have to cater to that knowledge base. One of the things that's been interesting in the language recently is because over the course of you know, decades, the ambient understanding of things changes, it allows you to put constructs into the language that you couldn't have put in 20 years ago, because people just didn't have a general understanding of that, and people would say, what is this? Um, but anyway, the, the, um, the thing that uh, uh, has happened is, you know, when I first was designing SMP, I thought I want to design a general system that does arbitrary computation. And so I went and studied theory of computation a whole lot. I'd been interested in that from a science point of view. And so I went and sort of tried to make the, the general symbolic system. And what I realized is, uh, thought, okay, this is a good idea. And then started building Mathematica and so on based on the same general idea. Every decade or so, I realized this is actually a much better idea than I ever thought it was. Um, and this whole notion of symbolic programming, that's just, you know, we realized, okay, we can represent documents, we can represent graphics, we can represent user interfaces as symbolic expressions, we can represent deployment mechanisms, we can represent processes, we can represent all these different kinds of things. And every, every few years, realize we can represent another kind of thing in the same framework. I'll mention one last thing about design, okay? So I've had, I've had uh, one of the things that was very useful for me, so in designing Mathematica and the Wolfram language, um, you know, that's a very precise design, uh, design activity. It's something where you're trying to make a very perfect design, you're trying to make something where you can build these bricks and go on building them forever. Um, and you, know, you worry about all the precedents, you know, you're trying to introduce a new thing. What are the precedents in the language for this thing? And you know, is this something that is going to fit in with everything else we built before? And there's a whole kind of scholarship associated with that that, um, uh, that we do. Okay, so then I started working on Wolfram Alpha. And the question was, would I design Wolfram Alpha the same kind of way as I design what's now the Wolfram language? And I said, no, let me go to the exact opposite extreme, okay? In, in the Wolfram language, we try and make everything beautifully consistent, perfect, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In Wolfram Alpha, I want to do nothing like that. I just want to have it do what I mean. I just want to have it be full of heuristics. I, I had thought previously heuristics were just the death of things. You could never design a, a reasonable system that used heuristics. But I said, in Wolfram Alpha, it's just going to be heuristics all the way down. It's just going to, you type something in, and it's going to do what people think it should do, okay? What I learned is that when you have a big enough tower of heuristics, they have a kind of logic all of their own. And in fact, in Wolfram Alpha, it's a very usable system. It's, it's interesting because it is a zero learning system. I mean, people, millions of people use it every day. There's no manual. There's nothing. People just go up to it, and they start typing things into it. Um, and it works. And about 97% of the time, it understands what they said. Um, so you know, what was interesting for me was this completely different design methodology of just have it be heuristics all the way down. Um, and you know, in Wolfram Alpha, we were trying to sort of represent the whole world, and there was a question of, you know, should we start off with a grand theory of the world? I've been uh, involved in science where I try and make grand theories of the world, and so there's a certain tendency to say, let's use a grand theory of the world. I said, let's do the exact opposite of that. Let's just build every domain separately so that it works, and then as we see what we've built, build bigger and bigger frameworks that connect those domains together. And that turned out to be a pretty good idea for Wolfram Alpha. Well, then, so then I realized a few years ago that I can kind of combine the sort of the Mathematica side of things and the Wolfram Alpha side of things to make something which is now the Wolfram language, where we're sort of combining two completely different design methodologies, the sort of natural language, do what I mean design methodology and the precise design methodology. And it's really neat what's happened because it means that you can, you know, you can go in, in the Wolfram language, you can actually type free-form linguistic input. It will try and convert it to precise Wolfram language form. When you're dealing with real-world entities, it would be hopeless if you had to have a manual that said, you know, New York City is represented in the system as the canonical name given in the US Gazetteer for whatever else it is. Right? You just want to type the name. Um, and, and that's what you can do, because you've combined this kind of natural language thing with, with, um, with this precise language definition. Okay, I can go and yak about language design forever, and I should, I should probably stop. But thank you very much. <laughs>